You're listening to the Andre Segovia Show. Welcome everyone to the Andres Segovia Show. I'm your host, Andres Segovia. On this episode, uh, uh, it's kind of like a pickup on a topic I've covered numerous times, but mostly in the early days of my show. Because uh, as I come up on my fourth anniversary of my program, four years, um, I've talked uh, a lot about educating individuals on um, how to get into real estate. And I'm actually intending to do a series of shorts that will be more on the social media side on just the ins and outs of what the process is in real estate, like what every step is and what it does and what it means. I'm trying to do it in bite-sized stuff. So if you're not already following me on social media, follow me at the Andres Segovia across everything except Twitter. On Twitter, it's underscore Andres Segovia. Uh, so you don't miss out on those little th- nuggets. And some of you might think, but Andres, it's in this economy, why would I even be considering buying a house? And that's exactly it, that uh, my number one real estate post, and this is the third year running that I'm posting it, is one where I basically tell people, if you're ready, able, and willing to buy a property, then go for it. And it doesn't matter what climate of the economy is, whether it's good or bad. Studies show that a property owner can better weather bad economic times better than a renter. Now, you probably ask yourself, that sounds kind of silly considering that if your income is hit, uh, you're not going to be able to pay your mortgage and things like that. No, understandably so. But here's the, the difference in philosophy and the mind shift that happens when you own your own home is that when you are a property owner, you'll be more prudent with your funds. You'll be better prepared for those rainy days because you have a home of your own to care for. The California Association of Realtors that I used to be a part of as of this recording, I'm not a member of the Association of Realtors. I am a real estate broker, but being a broker doesn't necessarily mean you are a realtor. A realtor title simply means that you are a union paying member into the National Association of Realtors. And that usually means that you're a member of three different unions. The National, which sets the uh, the guidelines for the entire um, the baseline for all the associations of realtors and the code of conduct for all of them. And then there's the state's chapter and eventually the local chapter. So when I was a realtor, I was part of the National Association of Realtors. So we get made from them. And because I'm in the state of California where I'm licensed, I was also a member of the California Association of Realtors. But where I found myself was in the regions of Orange County, uh, I chose to be a part of the Pacific West Association, Association of Realtors in Orange County. That w- that's not the only one there. There's a uh, numerous amounts in Orange County, but that's the one I decided to be with. And uh, for the most part, I really liked the ideology and the people that were behind um, there. And they still are to some extent, as, I, as uh, so I've as i seen some other mailers recently. I'm still on their mailing list, so I know I can reactivate my membership at any time. The th- reasons why I left, I've actually posted uh, or talked about before. If you don't know about this, then I'll leave a link on the show notes here. So for those of you, you know the drill. Anything that I reference here will be available on the show notes of companies episode at www.dangerousagoba.com. For those of you listening on Substack, just scroll down. You'll be able to find in there. Now, with respects to what update I'm doing, because the California Association of Realtors, they have a big event that happens every year. It's called Leg Day. It's a short way of spelling legislative day because the realtors go to Sacramento and go meet with their respective legislators from the assembly and the state Senate to talk about housing issues, local issues that could be brought to the attention. But mostly what oh, usually touched upon is the housing affordability crisis and the housing shortage. Um, nothing's really ever done, but at the lobbying level with the California Association of Realtors, they tend to lobby along with the, con- the commercial construction industries for changes to uh, building codes, for um, bills that they'll either sponsor bills, I mean, or just back certain bills and, you know, say we endorse this or we're against that and things like that. The propositions that you hear about whenever they're targeting, um, real estate 
Um, these are the major things that these lobbyists will either shill for or stand against. Well, there's an additional event that the California Association of Realtors is touting, and they're calling it Fair Housing Day. Uh, so this is more of a symposium of sorts, a uh, convention of different mindsets that are coming together to uh, to at least discuss and see what solutions they could come up with with respects to the housing issues from um, from yet another one, such as uh, the equity problem or the generational wealth gap that there are among minorities, particularly Blacks and Hispanics. That's what they're trying to highlight in these things. So they're bringing different speakers to present solutions that they can then uh, carry at least lobbying to legislative day, leg day. My issue with all that is that I've seen some of the activists, because they are activists, that have been brought forth to speak about housing. The ideologies are all, quite frankly, Marxists. So they're left, leftist ideologies that are trying to be put as solutions in our society that are, quite frankly, the antithesis of private property ownership. That's not how it works. So if you have competing ideologies, you're not going to have the solutions you're actually looking for. There is no meeting in the middle when the Marxist ideology, by spoken by the father of communists, which is Karl Marx, quite frankly said, communism can be summed up like this, the abolishing of private property. I even made a meme of that in my social media, so you can actually find it. I'll be posting it here. I've been sharing it recently because that is their goal. So if the California Association of Realtors, because they haven't announced who's going to be at this uh, fair housing thing, if they're going to be putting forth people that have only left-leaning ideologies and looking for housing solutions from them, when their ideology is the antithesis of what a real estate professional is meant to do, and that's helping people buy or sell or trade their property, those ideologies cannot coexist. Once again, they can, there cannot be a meeting in the middle. It was attempted before. The California Association of Realtors was uh, backing AB, it was called Assembly Bill 1482. And at first it was seeming like they were opposed to it, which there was, but after this back and forth between um, the legislators that were opposed to this thing, they were able to come towards some sort of agreement of sorts because some provisions were put in there that at the last minute were removed. But the language was so confusing that the Republican legislators that voted in support of it thought they were doing so because their lobbyists in the California Association of Realtors said so. So Assembly Bill 1482 passed the Assembly. And in the Senate, where it was 70% uh, of Democrats at the time, they had no problem signing this, and it went to Gavin Newsom's desk, and of course, he signed it. What was Assembly Bill 1482? A statewide rent cap, meaning it sets the current the, the, the rate at which property owners can raise their rents. Now, there are rent stabilization areas, or better known as rent stabilized ordinances in certain uh, cities and even counties in the state of California. But as soon as this was passed, it was basically the foundation for a statewide rent control. And for a lot of people, they do label this as rent control because to a certain extent, it's true, rent control, because now they're controlling the price of the rent. That, however, is not how I have defined it because rent control in practice is better described or better defined as what the rent stabilization ordinance is. Rent control is not just putting a rent cap. That's what we have statewide, but there's certain cities and counties in the state that have rent stabilization ordinances. And I've spoken about this before, but I'm going to reiterate it really quickly, quickly here. A rent stabilization ordinance isn't just a rent cap. It creates a new bureaucracy called the housing department or the housing division or the community housing something. LA has multiple of those. 
So they create this and they pack them with inspectors. These are not building inspectors from the building department of building and safety. These are activists disguised as inspectors that show up to properties and start issuing citations if they're saying that the safety and health, the health and safety uh, minimum requirements are not being met. Here's a citation. The property owner has to do these repairs, make these changes, blah, 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 to bring it up to code. Bring it up to code. I cannot tell you how many times the building inspector has shown up and gave a contradiction to what the housing inspector said. And because these are two separate divisions of the similar bureaucracy, because they're in the same city, they don't talk to each other. The onus is on the property owner to find a solution. And if the solution isn't found, the housing inspector issues more citations on top of the citations. And if the property owner does not fulfill any of them, the end goal of a rent stabilization ordinance is for eminent domain. The city takes control of the property owner's property because they say they're being irresponsible with it. They can't take care of it for themselves. They can't take care of the tenants. Therefore, we're going to do it. The property owners of your property owner in name only. This thing actually belongs to the state or in this case, the city and the city collects the rent, not the property owner. That folks is rent control. And that is what even the federal government has teased about. I talked about it in a previous episode, which I'll also be leaving a link down below. And I told you about this because the current administration campaigned on it. They want to get rid of the suburbs. So when I say that this episode is kind of picking up on something I've talked about before, especially the early days, I did two different series and added installments to them. One of those series is Real Estate 101, where it's I explained to you the ins and outs of real estate. What is a broker? What is an agent? What is an escrow? There is another angle of real estate that I had to address, and that's with respect to the information that was circulating the interwebs. Everybody turns to Google for information, and they usually stick to the first search results page. They never go to the second or the tenth page for other search results. They rely on the first page, not knowing that those search results are curated based on certain search words and who's paying more for those words. So certain uh, companies pay more for their stuff to be seen first. The highest bidder gets the exposure basically. And then one of those things has to be with these uh, blanket statements of supposed fact about real estate. So I did a segment called debunking real estate myths. So when I say that this episode in a way is addressing that, it's because, well, I already touched upon the concerns of what the California Association of Realtors has been espousing at, um, at the professional level and this expectations for their own um, agents and also at the legislative level of what it's what is ultimately affecting you, the consumer, that they're supposedly serving and they're not um, serving it as best as they can be. I spoke strongly about them before. I don't want to get strong on this one. But I can tell you that they have been a disservice to both the client and their own members for the past few years. And I was present for one of those meetings where the tension in that room could have been cut with a knife after AB 1482 passed and how the CAR was doing nothing about having it repealed. And it's not going to be repealed, to be honest with you. I did an episode where I addressed the myth that buying a home was not a good investment. This was before the peak of real estate, folks. It was about three years ago, four years ago, maybe. It peaked out last year. But before it even got to the peak, people were being discouraged from buying a home, both at the professional level for business investors, discouraging first-time home buyers from buying a home. These are Google search results, folks, and I have the receipts to prove it. They were discouraging people from buying. That the money didn't add up. It didn't make sense that your interest should be getting a duplex, that your interest should be getting multifamily residential property and ultimately work your way up to commercial. These blanketed statements, while make sense to the business mindset, they completely negate the fact that a homeowner, first off, homeownership is the American dream. A homeowner access to buying your home is the most important goal that you ever set in life because it means raising a family in a place you can call your own. And these buffoons, from the perspective of money, discouraging people from doing so, 
And I know individuals personally, friends and family that have been swept away by that ideology. And here I am swimming against the current, telling them that that's not the case. And now some of them are wishing they listened and now they can't make that move. Now there was the other uh, angle to this. At the time, they said no to the purchase of property because if you buy your own property, it will encourage you to buy more, have more than one car. It would discourage you depending on where you live and possibly further away from where you work, meaning that means you have to commute and you won't take mass transit if it's not widely available. That you'll probably have the space to own a pet, uh, to maybe have a, a family, a bigger family. And all of this, including whatever you're buying and consuming in your home, is adding to your carbon footprint. So in the argument of global warming, which is the global cooling, which back to global warming, but first of all, global cooling, but now we're at climate change because they can't make up their minds. Uh, that is what was supposedly the number one argument for discouraging a property. Those are the two topics that I addressed early on in my show when it was considered more opinionated. Um, understood. Some people don't like that, but I'm speaking out of fact. And I brought the facts with me, but some people just dismiss it as opinion because they don't agree with it. It's not about agreeing. It's about what you can do or what you won't do. About a year or two after that, I did a an episode of basically expanding on why or how we're going to get to the point of the elimination of private property. Again, I said it's a leftist ideology. And sure enough, lockstep during the before the peak of the housing market, we had multiple articles saying that you shouldn't buy a property because you were participating in systemic racism. Ownership of property that should be illegal because it perpetuates the master versus slave uh, ideology. We need to relabel the master bedroom, the master bathroom, because it has this master and slave component to the language being used. And some in the industry shifted to that. Um, real estate professionals were being told that they should be more sensitive with that. Interior designers and architects and engineers were also told about that very same thing. And some of them did change their language. There's the ideology that's trying to just, discourage this home ownership. And in the past 12 months that we've been in this uh, downturn in the economy, this inflation, yes, it's inflation, um, yes, it's a recession. All of a sudden, we're getting calls about, we need to have programs. And in the case of Bank of America, they actually implement something like this, encouraging first-time homeownership. Uh, and we want to do these first-time homeownership loan programs to minority groups only, specifically Hispanic and Blacks. And my first thought was, you want to revisit the Community Reinvestment Act? The very thing that got us into the mess just a few years ago, again, the subprime mortgage mess was literally just that. The relaxing of lending rules required by the government and enforced through Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac telling the banks to remove their safeguards and hand out the loans because as President then President Bill Clinton said, housing is a human right. It was a Community Reinvestment Act of 1993. A lot of it is covered, including how Fannie Mae through Johnson, what's his face, who ran the, the thing at the time, how they ran a private agent, a government agency as a for-profit company to uh, basically hand out all these subprime mortgages to people who couldn't afford them. And then we got into the mess that we, that we got it. And now they're trying to use um, racial equity as a way to bring back those programs to individuals that may not be able to afford it. What do you think is going to put us in? And now they want to bring a similar program and specifically only for Hispanics and Blacks. And while me being Hispanic myself, I got to tell you, I was very offended by that. I honestly look at that. That's not affirmative action. And even if it was, I call affirmative action racist. And quite frankly, I find that very racist. And now... There's articles, even from Business Insider, I've seen something like this touch upon by Forbes, and the California Association of Realtors was highlighting it because they saw it too, where Business Insider was making the case that, hey, 
in order to address systemic uh, our, our housing crisis, in order to um, address the birthing rates issues, in order to address uh, a lot of our political issues in this country, we need to encourage and in, and in a way incentivize home ownership. Well, duh, I told you that. And then they even got to the point when saying, and being a homeowner also uh, helps against climate change. Wait, 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 wait. Why all of a sudden in 2023 are all the things that I have been addressing? I mean, I, I want to say it's a good thing, right? Because isn't that what I've been talking about for almost four years? And all of a sudden, everybody's saying that, yeah, basically Andres is right. <laughs> um, but why all of a sudden are they saying this? You got to buy a house. And then I turn around and ask, okay, how many are ready, able, and willing now compared to those that were just several years ago? How many of you have had to dip into your savings to make ends meet? How many of you had to use credit cards because you can't make it from paycheck to paycheck to cover all your expenses? I can relate. Absolutely. So if you didn't have the funds, how can you have them now to buy in a more expensive climate? My position remains the same. If you're ready, able, and willing, go for it. But if you can't afford it, how do you step into it? But if there's more clamoring to say, we need people to own a home, because that's the only way. And this connects back to what I said at the beginning, legislative day, fair housing, and what others have said. They're going to want subsidized housing. They're going to want government housing for individuals. That, folks, is not homeownership, owning private property. You become a property of the state. That is basically rent control in the other form, where they trick you into thinking we're helping you. But now they set the rates, they control it, you match it to them. And if that's what you want, by all means, go for it. There's is such thing as Section 8. But that's not how private property works. Private property is where you are the owner. Where you're encouraged to grow your home. Where you're encouraged to grow your wealth. Some people think that whatever money is available, that's it. That's the pie. Everybody tries to get a slice. Someone tries to get a bigger slice than the other. Or someone runs away with the whole pie. And, and that's like, oh, how, what do you do then when someone has a bigger slice of the pie. You make more pies. Well, how do you make more pies? You mean the treasury just prints out more money? No, 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 no. I'm not talking about those greenbacks that are valueless. We're talking about actually growing value. Something that's worth, something that's tangible. And that is real estate. The tried and true process and method. Since the beginning of time, owning a property has been a thing. Owning your home, growing it. Only multiple homes. Not saying that you're living in all of them, but you're making it work for you. I mean, to get to the point where your income is basically paying for your own expenses and you don't have to work another minute in order to make ends meet, who doesn't want to get to that point where your investment starts working for you and starts paying dividends? Everybody wants that and it can be achieved for the long term only through real estate investment only because in good times and bad times, you'll still have your home. It'll make you prudent. It'll make you more responsible. That doesn't mean everybody turns out responsible. But the point is, if you're more concerned, oh, I have a house. Not the interest rate so high out there. Yeah, but you have a fixed rate. I know, but not the interest rate so high. Were you looking to refi? No. So what are you concerned about? Well, the interest rate's so high, but it's not affecting you. It's your home. You're in your home. You're enjoying your home. You're not selling your home, are you? No. So are you concerned about the prices of housing right now? Well, I shouldn't be, right? Because I'm in my own home. I have my mortgage and that's what I'm paying. And I am financially secure and I have a stable job. Then you shouldn't be worried about that. You're solid. That's the point. It makes you more prudent. And I encourage every single one of you to look into this. Even in now, despite everything I said, I'm encouraging you, especially you're a renter. I encourage you to look into the possibility 
of being able to afford a house because a lot of you, especially here in California, are high earner renters that have been lied to, that are told that don't buy a house because it's too much money. It's not worth your while, but your rent is higher than a mortgage. I don't know how any of that makes sense, but you're just throwing your money away. And if you really hate your property owners, is then hit them where it hurts, become their competition, become a property owner yourself. That's my encouragement for absolutely everybody that wants to stick it to their so-called landlord. And that's where I'll leave it for you folks. Thank you so much for joining me on this latest episode of the Andressa Gilvey Show. Any links, any references and articles will be in the show notes of this episode at www.thesegoway.com. For those of you listening on Substack, just scroll down, you'll find it there. For the rest of you, remember, like, share, subscribe, stay in the know, and you will be in the know. And I'll see you on the next one.